How Civilizations Fade Away and Die Out by Gustave Le Bon Disillusion of Psychological Species How hereditary dispositions which had required centuries for their formation may be rapidly lost. A very long time is always necessary for a people to raise itself to a high level of a civilization, and in some cases a very short time for it to descend therefrom. The principal factors in the decadence of a people is the lowering of its character. The mechanism of the dissolution of civilizations has hitherto been the same for all peoples. Symptoms of decadence presented by some Latin peoples. Development of egoism. Diminution of initiative and willpower. Lowering of character and morality. The youth of the present day. Probable influence of socialism. Its dangers and its strength how it will cause the civilizations that undergo it to return to wholly barbarous forms of evolution, the peoples among whom it will be able to triumph. Psychological species are not eternal any more than are anatomical species. The conditions of environment which maintain the fixity of their characteristics do not last forever. If the environment is modified, the elements of the mental constitution which it has determined end by undergoing retrograde transformations, which lead up to their disappearance. In accordance with physiological laws, as applicable to the cells of the brain as to those of the body, are observed in all beings. The organs take infinitely less time to disappear than was required for their formation. Every organ that does not fulfill its function soon ceases to be able to fulfill it. The eyes of fish that live in the lakes of caverns lose the power of sight after a time, and this infirmity ends by becoming hereditary. Indeed, even if observation be confined to the brief life of the individual, an organ that has perhaps demanded thousands of centuries for its formation by slow adaptations and hereditary accumulations, is rapidly stricken with atrophy when it ceases to be used. The mental constitution of beings cannot escape these physiological laws. The brain cell that is not utilized ceases to fulfill its functions, and mental dispositions it took centuries to form may be promptly lost. Courage, initiative, energy, the spirit of enterprise, and various qualities of character that were a long time in being acquired disappear quickly enough when they cease to be exercised. This fact explains how it is that a people always requires a very long time to raise itself to a high level of culture, and in some cases a very short time to descend into the abyss of decadence. When the causes are examined that led to the successive ruin of the various peoples with which history is concerned, whether the people in question be the Persians, the Romans, or any other nation, the fundamental factor in their fall is always found to be a change in their mental constitution resulting from the deterioration of their character. I cannot call to mind a single people that has disappeared in consequence of the deterioration of its intelligence. For all the civilizations of the past, the mechanism of disillusion has been identical. So identical, indeed, that it may be asked with the poet whether history, which has so many books, has but a single page. When a people reaches that degree of civilization and power at which it is assured that it is no longer exposed to the attacks of its neighbors, it begins to enjoy the benefits of peace and material well-being procured by wealth. At this juncture, the military virtues decline, the excess of civilization creates new needs, and egoism increases, having no ideal beyond the hasty enjoyment of rapidly acquired advantages, the citizens abandon to the state the care of public affairs, and soon lose all the qualities that had made their greatness. Then barbarian or semi-barbarian neighbors whose needs are few but who are strongly attached to an ideal invade the two civilized people and proceed to form a new civilization with the debris of that which they have overthrown. It was in this way that, in spite of the formidable organizations of the Romans and the Persians, the barbarians destroyed the empire of the former and the Arabs that of the latter. 
It was not in the qualities appertaining to the intelligence that the invaded peoples were lacking. From this point of view, no comparison was possible between the conquerors and the conquered. It was when Rome already bore within it the germs of its approaching decadence that it counted the greatest number of men of culture, artists, men of letters, and men of learning. Almost all the works that have made its greatness date from this period of its history. But Rome had lost that fundamental element which no development of the intelligence can replace, character. Footnote. Quote, the evil from which Roman society was then suffering, unquote, writes M. Faustel de Collange, quote, was not the corruption of the morals, it was the weakening of its will power, and so to speak, the enervation of its character. Unquote. End of footnote. The old time Romans had very few wants and a very strong ideal. This ideal, the greatness of Rome, absolutely dominated their souls, and each citizen was ready to sacrifice to it his family, his fortune, and his life. When Rome had become the pole of the universe, the richest city of the world, it was invaded by foreigners hailing from all countries, and whom it admitted in the end to rights of citizenship. As all they demanded was to be allowed to enjoy the luxury of Rome, they had but little concern for its glory. The great city then became an immense caravansary, but was no longer Rome. It seemed to be still alive, but its soul had long been dead. Analogous causes of decadence threaten our hyper-refined civilizations, which are menaced, however, as well by other causes due to the evolution produced in men's minds by modern scientific discoveries. Science has renewed our ideas and deprived our religious and social conceptions of all authority. It has shown man the trifling place he occupies in the universe and the utter indifference of nature towards him. He has perceived that what he used to term liberty was merely ignorance of the causes of which he is the slave, and that in view of the inexorable necessities of which they are the puppets, to be slaves is the natural condition of all living beings. He has learned that nature ignores what we term pity, and that all the progress it has realized has been due to a pitiless process of selection that involves the perpetual crushing of the weak by the strong. All these harsh and glacial conceptions, so contrary to the teachings of the old beliefs that enchanted our forefathers, have given birth to ominous conflicts in men's souls. In vulgar brains they have engendered that state of anarchy as regards his ideas which seems characteristic of the modern man. In the case of the young generation of artists and men of letters, these same conflicts have resulted in a sort of sullen indifference that is fatal to the will in an utter incapacity to embrace any cause whatever with enthusiasm, and in an exclusive cult of immediate and personal interests. Commenting upon a very just reflection of a modern writer to the effect that the, quote, sense of the relative dominates contemporary thought, unquote. A minister of public instruction proclaimed with evident satisfaction in a recent speech that, quote, the substitution of relative ideas for abstract notions in every field of human knowledge is the greatest conquest of science, unquote. The conquest declared to be new is in reality very old. It was achieved many centuries ago by the philosophers of India. Let us not be too ready to congratulate ourselves that it is tending at the present day to gain ground. The real danger to modern societies lies precisely in the fact that men have lost confidence in the worth of the principles that serve as their foundations. I greatly doubt whether it would be possible to cite in all history a single civilization, a single institution, a single belief that has succeeded in holding its own by taking its stand on principles esteemed to have only a relative value. Moreover, if the future seems to belong to those socialist doctrines which reason condemns, it is because they are the only doctrines whose upholders speak in the name of truths they declare to be absolute. The masses will always turn towards those who speak to them of absolute truths, and will slight all others. To be a statesman, it is necessary to be able to penetrate the soul of the multitude, to understand its dreams, and to renounce philosophic abstractions. Things in themselves change but little. 
It is only the ideas that are formed of them that change greatly. It is on these ideas that it is needful to know how to act. Doubtless, our knowledge of the real world is limited to appearances, to mere states of conscience of which the value is evidently relative. But when we adopt the social standpoint, we can say that for a given age and a given society, there are conditions of existence, moral laws and institutions which have an absolute value, since the society in question could not subsist without them. As soon as this value is called in question, or doubt enters men's minds, the society is condemned to an early death. The truths just enunciated may be inculcated without fear, for they are among those which no science can contest. Contrary language can only bring about the most disastrous consequences. The philosophic nihilism propagated at the present day by authorized voices among weak minds induces them to believe at once in the absolute injustice of our social system and in the absurdity of all monarchies, inspires them with a hatred of all that exists, and leads them directly to socialism and anarchism. Modern statesmen are too persuaded of the influence of institutions and too little of the influence of ideas, and yet science shows them that the former are always the offspring of the latter, and have never been able to subsist without leaning on them as a foundation. Ideas represent the invisible springs of things. When they have disappeared, the underlying supports of constitutions and civilizations are destroyed. It was always a redoubtable moment for a people when its old ideas descended into the somber necropolis where the dead gods repose. Going on from the causes to study the effects, it has to be admitted that visible decadence seriously threatens the vitality of the majority of the great European nations, and especially of those known as the Latin nations, and really Latin nations if not as regards their blood, at least as regards their traditions and education. Every day they are losing their initiative, their energy, their will, and their capacity to act. The satisfaction of perpetually growing material wants tends to become their sole ideal. The family is breaking up. The social springs are strained. Discontent and unrest are spreading to all classes, from the richest to the poorest. Like the ship that has lost its compass and strays as chance and the winds direct, the modern man wanders at haphazard through the spaces formerly peopled by the gods and rendered a desert by science. He has lost his faith, and with it his hopes. The masses grown excessively impressionable and changeable, and no longer kept in check by any barrier, seem fated to oscillate without intermission between the wildest anarchy and the most oppressive despotism. Words will turn their heads, but their divinities of a day are soon their victims. In appearance they seem ardently to desire liberty. In reality, they will have none of it and they are incessantly appealing to the state to forge them chains. They yield blind obedience to the obscurest sectaries, to the most narrow-minded despots. The rhetoricians who imagine they lead the masses, but who most often follow them, confound the impatience and nervousness that find vent in an incessant desire for a change of master, with the true spirit of independence that girds against any master whatever. The state, whatever be the nominal regime, is the divinity towards which all parties turn. It is the state that is appealed to for regulations and protection, every day more oppressive, that surround the most trivial acts of existence with the most Byzantine and tyrannical formalities. The younger generations are more and more disposed to renounce careers demanding judgment, initiative, energy, personal effort, and will. The slightest responsibility alarms them. They are content with the mediocre prospects offered them by state-paid employment. The commercial classes ignore the colonies, which are solely peopled by functionaries. Footnote. In a speech pronounced in the chamber on deputies on November 27, 1890, by M. Etienne, at the time Under Secretary for the Colonies, I note the following very characteristic passage, which I borrow from the newspaper, Le Cicle. Quote, Cochin, China, has 1,800,000 inhabitants. Of this number, 1,600 are Frenchmen, 1,200 of whom are functionaries. The country is administered by a colonial council, elected by these 1,200 functionaries. It has a deputy, 
and you are surprised that anarchy reigns in the country exclamation and laughter on a great number of benches Quote, are you aware what is the outcome of such a system its outcome is this phenomenon that nine millions out of a budget reduced to twenty two millions is absorbed by the expenses in connection with the functionaries Quote, yes in eighteen seventy seven i tried to reduce the number of functionaries i reduced the expenses by three million five hundred thousand francs out of a total of nine millions i took this measure in the month of october in december the cabinet of which i was a member was overthrown and in the following march the functionaries i had suppressed were reinstated unquote. end of footnote energy and action have been replaced among statesmen by terribly empty personal discussions in the case of the masses by passing enthusiasms or hatreds in the case of men of letters by a sort of tearful vague and unfruitful sentimentalism and by colorless dissertations on the miseries of existence a boundless egoism is developing on all sides the individual is coming to be solely preoccupied with himself consciences are capitulating and morality is deteriorating and gradually dying out footnote this lowering of morality is serious when observed in professions such as the magistracy and the profession of notary in which honesty used to be as general as courage among soldiers as regards the notaries morality has at present descended to a very low level the official statisticians affirm quote, that among the notaries there is a proportion of forty three accused persons out of ten thousand individuals whereas the average for the whole population of france is one accused person for the same number of individuals unquote. in a report addressed to the president of the republic by the minister of justice and published in the journal officiel january thirty first eighteen ninety i find the following passage quote, the disasters which as early as 1840 had begun to inspire the public with uneasiness increased progressively to such a degree that, in 1876, one of my predecessors had to call the special attention of the magistrates to the situation of the notaries. The dismissal of notaries and notorial catastrophes were occurring with unaccustomed frequency and under circumstances of great gravity. The number of disasters rose successively from 31 in 1882 to 41 in 1883 to 54 in 1884 to 71 in 1886 and the total embezzlements committed by notaries amounted to 62 million francs for the period between 1880 and 1886 finally in 1889 103 notaries were dismissed or obliged to give up their practice Unquote. If we connect with these facts the successive ruin of our most important financial enterprises, the Comptoir des Comptes, the Depot et Comptes Corrents, Panama, etc., it can only be admitted that the invectives of the socialists against the morality of the leading classes are not without foundation. The same symptoms of demoralization are unfortunately to be observed among all the Latin peoples. The scandal of the Italian state banks, in which robbery was practiced on an immense scale by politicians of the foremost rank, the bankruptcy of Portugal, the wretched financial situation of Spain and Italy, the profound decadence of the Latin republics of America, prove that the character and morality of certain peoples have sustained incurable injury, and that their role in the world is nearly at an end. End of footnote. The individual is losing all empire over himself. He can no longer govern himself, and the man who cannot govern himself must inevitably come before long to be governed by others. To change all this would be a hard task. It would be necessary to change, first of all, our lamentable Latin education. It is fatal to any initiative and energy that heredity may have spared. It extinguishes every gleam of intellectual independence by giving young people as their sole ideal hateful examinations, which, as they only demand efforts of the memory, place in the front rank of our professions intelligences whose servile aptitude for imitation is the negation of all individuality and all personal efforts. Quote, I try to pour iron into the soul of my pupils, unquote, said an English schoolmaster to Guizot when he was visiting the schools of Great Britain. Where among the Latin nations are the schoolmasters or the programs capable of realizing such an ambition? 
The military regime will perhaps realize it. In any case, it is the sole educator that is capable of realizing it. One of the principal conditions of improvement for decadent peoples is the organization of a very severe universal military service and the permanent menace of disastrous wars. It is to this general lowering of character, to the powerlessness of the citizens to govern themselves, and to the egotistic indifference that is more especially due the difficulty experienced by the majority of the Latin peoples in living under liberal laws, as far removed from despotism as from anarchy. It is easily understandable that such laws should be little to the liking of the masses, for Caesarism holds out to them the promise if not of liberty, on which they do not set much store at any rate, of a very considerable measure of equality in servitude. On the other hand, it would be incomprehensible that republican institutions should encounter most opposition from the enlightened classes, but for the necessity of taking into account the weight of ancestral influences. Is it not without such institutions that all forms of superiority, and intellectual superiority in particular, have most chance of being able to display themselves? It might even be said that the only real objection to such institutions, from the point of view of those who stand out for equality at any price, is the fact that they favor the formation of powerful intellectual aristocracies. The most oppressive of regimes, on the contrary, both for character and for the intelligence, is Caesarian in its various forms. All that can be said for it is that it facilitates equality in degradation and humility in servitude. It is well adapted to the inferior minds of decadent peoples, and that is why they always revert to it as soon as they are able. The plume of the first general that comes along will be made the excuse for its adoption. When a people has reached this pass, its hour has struck, its destiny is accomplished. At the present hour, this old-time Caesarian, which history has always seen appear at the earliest dawn of civilizations, and at their extreme decadence, is undergoing a manifest evolution. Today we are witnessing its resurrection under the name of socialism. This new expression of state absolutism will assuredly be the most grievous form of Caesarism, because being impersonal, it will escape all the motives of fear that keep the worst tyrants under restraint. Socialism appears today to be the gravest of the dangers that threaten the European peoples. It will doubtless complete a decadence for which many causes are paving the way, and it will perhaps mark the end of Western civilization. To appreciate its dangers and its strengths, it is not the teachings it spreads abroad that must be considered, but the devotion it inspires. Socialism will soon constitute the new faith of the suffering masses, whose existence is often and inevitably rendered far from enviable by the economic conditions of contemporary civilization. It will be the new religion that will people the empty heavens. For all the human creatures who cannot support misery unrelieved by illusion, this religion will replace the illuminous paradise of which the painted windows of the churches spoke to them in the past. This great religious entity of tomorrow sees the crowd of its faithful increase every day. It will soon have its martyrs, and it will then become one of those religious creeds which stir up peoples and whose power over souls is absolute. That the dogmas of socialism lead to a regime of degrading slavery, which will destroy all initiative and all independence in the souls bowed beneath its empire, is doubtless evident, but only by psychologists acquainted with the condition of man's existence. Such foresight is beyond the reach of the masses. They require arguments of a different order to persuade them, and these arguments have never been furnished by reason. That the new dogmas we see coming into being are contrary to the most elementary good sense is also evident. But were not the religious dogmas that have guided men during so many centuries also contrary to good sense? And has the fact hindered them from subjecting the most luminous geniuses to their laws? In the matter of his beliefs man only hearkens to the unconscious voice of his sentiments. They form an obscure domain from which reason has always been excluded. In consequence, and by the mere fact of the mental constitution created them by a long past, the peoples of Europe will be obliged to undergo the redoubtable phase of socialism. It will be the signal for their entry on one of the last stages of decadence. By causing civilization to revert to wholly inferior forms of evolution, it will facilitate the destructive invasions by which we are threatened. Outside Russia, 
whose population from the psychological point of view is much more asiatic than european the english would seem to be almost the only race in europe possessing sufficient energy stable enough beliefs and a sufficiently independent character to avoid succumbing to the new religion the birth of which we are witnessing modern germany in spite of deceptive appearances of prosperity will doubtless be its first victim judging from the success of the various sects that abound within its frontiers the socialism that will prove its ruin will doubtless be couched in strictly scientific formulae of value at the best for an ideal society such as humanity will never produce but this latest child of pure reason will be more intolerant and more redoubtable than all its elders no people is so well prepared as germany to accept its yoke no people of the present age has more entirely lost its initiative its independence and the habit of self-government footnote the most eminent german writers are perfectly agreed on this point in his recent book on the social questions herr t ziegler professor at the university of strasbourg expresses himself as follows quote, while quote, self-help is the dominant tendency in england recourse to the state is the characteristic of germany we are a people that for centuries has been accustomed to be under a guardian moreover during the last twenty years the strong arm of bismarck by assuring us security has caused us to lose the sentiment of responsibility and initiative it is for this reason that in difficult and even in easy cases we appeal for the aid and protection of the state and abandon ourselves to its initiative Unquote. end of footnote as to russia it has evolved too recently from the regime of the quote, mere unquote. that is to say from primitive communism the most perfect form of socialism to return to this inferior stage of evolution it has other destinies it is doubtless russia that will one day furnish the irresistible flood of barbarians destined to destroy the old civilizations of the west whose end will have been led up to by economic struggles and socialism this hour however has not struck as yet to reach it we have still to traverse certain phases socialism will be too oppressive a regime to last it will make people regret the age of tiberius and caligula and will bring back that age one sometimes asks how the romans of the time of the emperors so easily supported the wild ferocity of certain despots the reason is that they too had traversed social struggles civil wars and proscriptions and the experience had cost them their character they had come to consider these tyrants as the ultimate instruments of their salvation they put up with everything from them because they did not know how to replace them the truth is they cannot be replaced after them came the final catastrophe brought about by the barbarians history always turns in the same circle you have been listening to book four chapter one of the psychology of peoples by gustave le bon for the entire audio book recording search for the psychology of peoples by gustave le bon this has been a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.